Hello everyone, in today's video, I'm going to be reviewing Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein from 1948. At this point in time, in the late 40s, Universal was really fresh out of ideas. Audiences didn't find the mantra scary at this point because of the real horrors of World War II at the time. At this point in time, Universal made the monsters recombinant instead of taking them seriously at this point. The movie's debatable The movie's debatable on whether or not this is in the same universe as the other films. For me personally, I really do not count this film in the same universe as the last previous films. I really consider it its own movie and a parody, but that's just my opinion. Regardless of this movie taking the same universe or not, I still love Abbott and Costello Frankenstein. It is funny, one of the funniest films ever and one of the best horror comedies ever made. In the past, when people have asked me, like, what was the first ever Universal Monster movie I saw as a kid, it's really like, hard to tell and remember, because honestly, I feel like my earliest memory of a Universal Monster movie was probably this movie, Young Frankenstein. Basically, I saw the parody before I saw the real horror dramatic films. But hey, we all gotta start somewhere. Not only was it the first Universal Monster movie I saw, it was also the first time I ever saw an Abbott and Costello movie. And the first time I ever watched the movie with like multiple subgenres, horror and comedy combined. I love the opening cartoon intro scene. Abbott and Costello made Frankenstein was directed by Charles Barton and produced by Robert Arthur. The story was done by Robert Lees and Frederick I. Ronaldo. And the screenplay was done by John Grant. The movie stars Bud Abbott, Lou Costell, Juan Cheney Jr., Bela Lugosi, Glenn Strange, Leonor Albert, and Jane Rudolph. Abbott and Costell Meets Frankenstein was released on June 15, 1948. Abbott and Costell Meets Frankenstein is about Chicken Wilbur delivering coffins to a House of Horrors wax museum. Mr. McDill demands they be delivered personally so they are inspected by insurance purposes. Wilbur suspects that Dracula and the Frankenstein monster are real in the crates, but Chick does not believe in thinking that he's just a scaredy cat. Dracula hypnotizes Wilbur, escapes with the Frankenstein monster, and Wilbur and Chick are arrested for being misunderstood for thinking that they stole the crates. Dracula wants to put Wilbur's brain inside the monster's body. Abbott and Costello were a buddy comedy back in the 1940s and 50s. They got their first star on radio back in the 1930s before they made movies in the 40s and 50s. Abbott and Costello were funny guys. They were funny, hilarious, hysterical. They were one of my favorite buddy crew comedies as a kid growing up, along with the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy. Abbott and Costello had great chemistry together. They had a lot of very well-known famous skits. The very well-known was the Who's on First routine. When I was 10 years old, I went to Cooperstown with my family on a vacation. We went to the Baseball Hall of Fame Museum. They had this like little small room of like statues of Abbott and Costello from the movie The Naughty 90s and they had a voice recording of the famous Who's on First routine. It was fun and awesome. Also a little fun fact about me, I'm a baseball fan and a huge diehard Yankee fan. Despite playing characters, they're basically like playing themselves in this movie, Abbott and Costello. This movie has like some of the funniest moments that always like made me laugh to this day no matter how many times I've seen this movie over and over again. Lou Costello has some of the best funny moments in this movie. When Lawrence Talbot calls Will for telling him not to deliver the crates knowing that Dracula and the Frankenstein monster are in those crates, he turns into a werewolf and Lou is confused thinking that he's talking to his dog. When Lawrence growls, Wilbur's response is, Mr. McDougal, will you please stop gargling your throat? <laughs> and then he growls and growls and he goes, You didn't have to call me all the way from London just to have your dog call me on the phone. Row! Row! When Wilbur drops Lawrence Talbot's luggage at his apartment, 
he leaves him a note, not knowing that the Wolfman's right behind him trying to attack him. He takes an orange, leaves the room, locks the door, and just when he's about to go back to his apartment room, he looks at the orange, feeling guilty, thinking, I wonder if he counted these. He's about to return the orange. Then all of a sudden, he drops the orange and hits himself. And then he goes, I guess not. <laughs> One of my favorite funny movie moments in this movie is when Wilbur and Chick are in the castle trying to find Dracula and the Frankenstein monster. Wilbur goes to this wall. When he finds Dracula and the Frankenstein monster, he runs to go get Chick to show him that he found them. But every time they go back through the wall, <laughs> Dracula and the Frankenstein monster get to the other side before Chick and Wilbur can find them. <laughs> but then in a second attempt, again, the same thing. And then Chick asks, where are they? And Wilbur goes, they must be in there. <laughs> that scene when Luke Costello is sitting on Glenn Strange, the monster, and he's hitting his hand. There's actually a bluegrass showing how like, Glenn Strange had a hard time keeping a straight face during the making of that scene. It's so funny. It's funny when Chick doesn't believe Wilbur that the monsters are real. But Abbott puts a wolf mask on and Lawrence Talbot tells him not to wear that wolf mask, reminding about how like when the full moon rises, he'll become a werewolf. And Lou Costello's response is, you and 20 million other guys around, then he shoves him in the locker. <laughs> when Wilbur tells uh, Lawrence Talbot, I used to be a wolf myself, and then he grabs him <laughs> because he's insulted by his wolf jokes. McDougal, the businessman, he's such a jerk and an asshole. When he assaults Wilbur because of the stolen crates that are still being missed at large, in real life, he'd be arrested for that. When Wilbur tells McDougal that I'm a union man, works 16 hours a day, a union man only works 40 hours a week. I belong to two unions. Get those crates down to my place. And Wilbur goes, oh, wait. When McDougal hits uh, Lou, Bud Abbott tells him that we'll have you arrested for assault and battery. And McDougal goes, you don't have any witnesses. Bud gets a witness, and McDougal like, hits Lou again, takes the abuse. <laughs> the witness wore a night mask, and he says, I'm sorry, I couldn't see a thing. <laughs> that was one of their well-known skits, Bud Abbott enjoying abusing and torturing Lou Costello. Bud Abbott was such a jerk to Lou. When Wilbur describes the look of the monsters, the chick, it's so funny, like... <laughs> I saw what I saw what I saw. There's a running joke with this film how like Wilbur being short and fat, not smart and bright, and yet he's got a beautiful girlfriend in this movie. This is the second time Bale Lugosi has ever played Dracula in his career. He plays Dracula more as a parrot than being serious. The last time he played Dracula was in the first film in 1931. He played vampires in other films outside of Dracula. It was great to see Bela Lugosi come back as Dracula again, even though this is only a parody of the character. I kind of got tired of John Carradine after the last two movies. Jack! Jack! When Wilbur's reading the story of the House of Horrors on the Dracula story, he hears the coffin move and make noise. He calls, Jack! Jack! He calls Chick and Chick comes and doesn't believe him that the coffin moved. Or how like the candle move, and he goes, wait a minute, candles can't move? <laughs> One big error of this film that I want to point out is that the part when Dracula sucks Sandra's blood, you can see his reflection. Because I know that in other like vampire movies and stories, vampires have no reflection because they're dead. But I wonder if that was the joke and parody of it. In case you're wondering, like, why does Dracula want to put Lou Costello's brain in the Frankenstein monster? I have no idea. That's basically the joke of the story. No point or logic into it. You just go with the flow and just enjoy it and have fun with it. Lon Chaney Jr. is Lawrence Tell, and despite this being a parody, he's the only one that takes himself seriously in this film. 
The biggest letdown of this film is that Boris Karloff did not come back as the monster. It saddens me he didn't come back. Boris Karloff... Boris Karloff was offered to reprise his role as the monster in this film, but he turned it down thinking that the idea of the monsters being in a comedy movie would not be such a good idea. But later on he said that he regretted turning this movie down after the success of this movie. Because it really could have been cool. He could have had Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., and Bela Lugosi, the trinity of the Universal Monsters, in the same movie together. Like in The Bride of Frankenstein, the monster speaks, but not dramatic like in The Bride. He calls Dracula, Master. This movie is a monster brawl bash, the monsters chasing Abbott and Costello, and the Wolfman and Dracula fighting each other. It's a funny, silly, crazy finale in a crazy party in an awesome, entertaining way. The scenes when Lawrence Talbot turns into the werewolf, and the first scene is when they're in the forest looking for Joan. He turns into the werewolf. Wilbur confused and mistakes him thinking that it was Chick behind the mask, not knowing that it was the real wolf man. Or just like when they stopped the operation, Lawrence Talbot is uh, untying Wilbur, then all of a sudden he turns to the werewolf and he goes, What's the matter? Somebody else after me? Oh, it gets worse and worse. <laughs> The ending is funny in this film when the Invisible Man makes a small cameo setting up for a sequel voiced by Vincent Price. After the success of this movie, Abbott and Costello made more Universal Monster Horror sequels like Abbott and Costello Meets the Invisible Man, Abbott and Costello Meets the Killer Boris Karloff, and Abbott and Costello Meet the Mummy. I don't know why. Sometimes if you think about it, if they made a movie like this today, it'd be something like Jane Silent Bob or the Wayne Brothers meets Michael Myers, Freddy, or Jason. I'm not sure how that would turn out. I'm not sure that would even be a good idea. Well, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein may about be in the same continuity like the other films. This is still a fun, enjoyable, funny, entertaining comedy film to watch. And this is one of my personal favorites. This is one of my favorite horror comedy movies of all time. So that was my review of Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Please like the video, subscribe, hit that notification bell to get the latest updates on my YouTube channel. Since October being close into the near end around the corner, I decided throughout the entire year I'm just going to review horror films for the sake of it. But throughout the month of October I'm just going to keep it simple and do like horror franchises. Whereas throughout the year, I'll just do like regular solo reviews on a certain like horror film where it was only like one time film and did not have any sequels, except maybe for like a few exceptions. Like The Shining, there was a sequel to it called Dr. Sleep that came out recently two years ago. I might not consider that for like a, a horror franchise review. That's just going to be like two separate solo reviews throughout the entire year instead. On Halloween, you're going to get a special bonus where last year I was supposed to release my top 10 favorite. Universal Horror Reviews. This time you're going to get that video review. And also next month in November, you're going to get a few other light solo horror reviews for the fun, sake of it, and bonuses.